You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for July 10th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, where the radical left indoctrination is on the house. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. It's free. That's right. You don't, you don't have to give any money to Trump University to no. get liberally indoctrinated no. over here. Just belly up to the bar, you know. And <laughs> Come as you are. It's all free. As as I told Charlie Pierce when he told me today and the rest of the world that he had been blocked by Charlie Sykes. Um, That's amazing. Welcome to the band. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, uh, this is a lovely club. We're a little scruffy and a little low rent, but we're good storytellers, we're good company, and the, our pores are generous. So, yes, that's yeah, right. It's a good that's club to right. be in. It's a fine club to be in. And, you know, we were canceled long before cancel culture was cool. So, <laughs> you know, I, and I, I'm just, I'm watching these people all over the internet who are bleeding, you know, their, their, their stigmata, their cancel culture stigmata, um, who just block the shit out of everyone who doesn't agree with them. I don't want to hear from them. Don't want to talk to them. Um, we'll talk about that in greater depth in a little bit. But it's just, it's been a very strange week for people who think they want to be engaged in the arena of ideas and really, yeah, really free don't. speech, everybody. Yeah. But I'm going to block and everyone who's not a blue check, right? In my personal circle of friends, well, yes. And, and I'd like to engage in the marketplace of ideas in a robust way. Really, let's talk about the history of a Republican Party. No, 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 no. Shut up. Shut up. And the thing, again, I'm repeating myself, I know. The thing that pisses me off is so many of my liberal allies are like, shh, don't, don't. Don't talk about the past. Like, nope, sorry. I've been canceled. I don't exist. So you have no hold over me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know who mm -hmm. wasn't canceled this week? Joy Reid. I am so proud of her. I got to say gotta say she has her own show she's replacing she's worked hard for where she is she, she has. really has yeah she has somewhere yeah. in in uh brazil um glenn greenwald is seething i'm sure but you know <laughs> what I, I i try when i hear about good news for people that i, I like mm -hmm. i try not to think about the people who are angry about it i really do try no, to not, really. I, I guess who's gonna hate this no, no i'm yeah. just glad for yeah. um, for the sake of it well, um, and Chris Matthews was really nice about it on he was. Twitter. He he, was. he he congratulated her and everything. And I, I imagine that the people who used to be on Hardball are going to have a little bit of a whiplash from yeah. not being interrupted. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, well, you know. <laughs> we made a joke some time ago about Chris Matthews having his own cooking show where he just interrupts chefs all the time. You know, that's all he does. <laughs> but tell me about this soup. What do you think about this soup? Hey, you know what? I remember eating soup with Tip O'Neill. Ha! Ah, guess what? Oh, we're out of time. You know? <laughs> This was you did this for twenty years. I see. I remember a thing. Uh, this is for the olds out there, the old blog veterans. A thing called the Chris Matthews Show on Sundays. On Sundays, right? which I back before I had cable, or I lived up in the castle in Chicago, and I would watch the Sunday shows. And one of them was the Chris Matthews Show, and he would have on a wide cross section of guests. But I just Andrew remember Sullivan, Andrew <laughs> Sullivan, and David Brooks. David Brooks before he yeah. became David Brooks. Yeah. Um, and they would yeah. just slag because it was the, the height of um, hating liberals for opposing the war. And yeah. they would just slag people like us. And once again, all of them collectively would very much like if we never brought this shit up again. Again, yep. out of luck, because pretty much bringing this shit up is what I do. So uh, and speaking of bringing things up that used to be in a bad place are now in a good place. Congratulations to former Fox News host Shep Smith, who will be joining CNBC. Yeah. Speaking of cancel culture. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> all the people, all the conservatives on Twitter who thought they were personally responsible for getting Shep Smith fired from Fox. They're so proud. You know? Yeah. And and now now do uh, Brian Williams on MSNBC because we get to pick the twi right wing Twitter mob gets to pick who's on TV and who isn't. That's that's uh, their job. That's yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. And there was a little bit of insight on a Vanity Fair article this week about Laura Ingram that explains a lot oh. about her her current behavior. Not that it's changed that much, but mm -hmm. the fact that she's going all in with the white nationalism. Uh, apparently, she believes that Trump is going to lose in November, which is not a big, you know, risky bet. 
at this point. Um, vote as if he's 20 points ahead, though, everybody. Right. That's, that's right. Uh, Keep running hard. But she, uh, Laura Ingram, wants to replace Rush Limbaugh. Uh-huh. And uh, the very, very, very lucrative world of right-wing hate radio on AM, at, you know, Rush Limbaugh's network, mm-hmm. I'm sure it's worth a ton of money to her. She And, oh, sure. you know, she, she doesn't have to worry about the kind of sponsor. No. Uh, squeamishness that you do on Fox. So, well, and these are people who who are used to listening to Mark Levin. Yeah. <laughs> so you know their their brains are <laughs> wired to be able to listen to Laurie <laughs> and that comforting <laughs> devil drill going through a plank of slate voice of hers. <laughs> they're, the they're, way you do that is just it's so bad. It's like, so ooh. bad. And for you know for for relaxation, they they relax a little. Ben Shapiro and. <laughs> And I look over and like these guys it... do not have a voice for radio. No, they and, don't. And yeah, yet, there they are. Um, so I'm sure she'll fit right in. Uh, Rush Limbaugh. Um, I I will just say cannot last forever. Um, there will come a time in the um, future when he does not exist anymore on radio, and someone will move into that space because, as we know, it doesn't matter what happens to Donald Trump in the fall. It matters immensely. I'm sorry. It matters immensely what happens with Donald Trump. To in the, the country, fall. it matters. The country. Right. That, that solid lump of racist, paranoid idiots is going to stay right where it is and it will seek its own level. It will find someone who will It'll be find its a way, exactly, yeah. to blame others, to excuse their behavior, to excuse their loyalty to Trump. Mm-hmm. And and as you say, j- they'll find a way to land on their feet mm-hmm. and keep marching to the white nationalist drum. And, and they're yeah. a market. So they already have Tucker Carlson, who they will run for president right. at some point in the future. And they will anyone who can find a place as that that group of, of bigots and imbeciles uh, voice, public voice, you know, the, the voice in, in their head, your, your show should sound like the voice in their head. Mm-hmm. And Laura Ingram does that. Um, she has lost all but like three of her sponsors. It's now what the Slim Fast and My Pillow Hour. I mean, that's pretty no. Much they it. Lost, she, she lost Slim Fast. That's oh. a, that, that hurts a lot. Oh. It, it is as I call it the Laura Ingram My Pillow White Power Hour. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I think the White Power Hour. I think that somebody at Crooks and Liars came up with that one. Um, so let's talk for a minute about the Supreme Court because that was the big, huge news this week. Busy, busy, busy. Uh huh. As you know. Neither of us are lawyers. Uh, both of us were married to lawyers at one point. Everybody get the Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> reference that he just slipped in there? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Supreme Court, an important distinction on this uh, Mazars versus Trump, Trump versus Mazars case, which yeah. is the SDNY case, where yes. uh, it's important to, to recognize that this is not now Donald Trump has to give his tax returns no. to Cy Vance. Mazars is an international accounting firm with 40,000 employees. Right. And they will simply obey the court order. This is not something that they want to cost them any contempt of court violations right. no, or no. anything. Nope. Just no. here. They plan, they plan to be around in the fall and the spring. They, and... they, don't, they aren't subject to being elected or reelected. Yeah. They're just going to do what the court tells no, them to no, do. No, honey, no. Dying on Donald Trump's tax returns is the hill that they're going to die on. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> but, but at the same time, they're not going to piss off a client right. who would like to keep their records private until the court says, yeah, you got you to gotta fork them over. Absolutely. And then it's like, yes, sir. Here they are, sir. And you're done. So it's not Donald Trump turning over anything because you know those records are going to have Sharpie pen all over them. Oh, yeah. This this is Mazar's providing a copy to the court, providing a copy to the pro- to the grand jury, actually, not the prosecutor, the, mm-hmm. the grand jury, to say, here is what we filed on behalf of Donald Trump. And that's... And, and, and yeah. I, my understanding as a non-legal professional um, is that, number one, the New York court is already set up and ready to go. They're looking to find pieces to fit into sure. an indictment they already have set up and ready to go. Sure. So they're right. going right. to they're going to look for the for the missing Lego blocks mm-hmm. in the actual mm-hmm. financial filings and oh, here we go. This is the Russian money, Russian money, Saudi money, bribe money, hooker money. Oh, here we go. <laughs> That's and <laughs> or, we're off. Or, or more likely 
this this is the value he put on the property to exactly. the IRS, right. and this is the value he put on the property to the bank. Is it right. bank fraud or tax fraud? Yeah. Or both. Is Depends it both? On, or both. <laughs> and the other thing is that, uh, to quote your TV husband, Ely Mistal, um, yes. this is only like disappointing news to people who have no idea how anything works. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is very yeah. good news. This is a setting a, a bar. This is setting a precedent. It says that no president is above the law. If if properly um, informed and enforced, you have to turn over your papers. This is nothing new. <laughs> this is how we do things. And there's no way you're going to get around this. Uh, it did send back to Congress, you know, for a more tightly Worded. Right. Well, Congress has to follow rules in subpoenas right. of they have to have a legislative purpose. And that's, that's normal. Fine. And that's I, fine. it's not as if Nancy Pelosi isn't going to find an emoluments clause somewhere in the Constitution right. that says, yeah, I get to look at the president's tax returns to right. make sure he's not taking bribes from Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't it interesting that the two appoint two Trump appointees voted against him? And, you know, it was the deep state, two, deep state, <laughs> deep state for Lou Dobbs now thinks the deep state extends all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, Does it include the president who appointed those two justices? The you deep know, state includes everyone except Lou Dobbs and Donald Trump. Okay. Everyone else is a suspect. Everyone else is in on the conspiracy. And uh, I'm sure that's how the little. And this is the thing. When you have a long enough memory, you remember the Lou Dobbs you, used to just be this harmless little blob business guy mm -hmm. uh, who talked about the stock market and you know pork futures and that was it and he, that was his whole thing for years and then every the 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 world shifted under his feet and the, all the people who have no will who have no conscience who are just in it for the money who saw their business model changing um went all in with uh with the with team evil once the mask came off you had two choices to make you either get on the side of the righteous or you you hang in there because there's you you cannot survive outside of that ecosystem. And I'm not sure became is the right word. I'm I'm not sure if he wasn't that way all the time, um, and was just and was just wearing a suit of respectability because that's how you get paid. Or the other way around that he always was this sort of milk toast, middle of the road, you know, uh, 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 chamber of commerce Republican until that became a poor business choice. And he just decided he'd become a lunatic for money. Well, and the business choice, as we've said before, and I, I appreciate the person on Twitter who pointed out that I think it was last week, we called OANN OANON. Yes. <laughs> um, the, the job that Lou Dobbs has now is to keep those who might drift away from Fox business to OANN right. happy. And that means worshiping Donald Trump on a daily basis. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that it's Thomas and Alito who are now really out of the stream of yeah. normalcy on the right. court? Tom, Thomas uh, has always been just yeah. a shit, just a a, a, yeah. A, yeah. a walking turd his entire career with his crazy ass wife running her crazy yeah, ass huge, wing that lobbying huge firm. Huge conflict of interest, yeah. not, not always uh, filing all the right financial records you know that's corruption there also the supreme court this week uh upheld the trump administration's regulation to allow employers with religious objections to opt out of the affordable care Act's requirement to provide contraceptive care mm -hmm. uh 70 to 126 thousand women could lose contraceptive coverage from their employers yeah this is, is an outrage it is absolutely is and i'm sorry but if you're gonna if you're going to be that, then you're a business. And if you're a business, you should be taxed. And yep. those tax and your tax dollars should go to providing birth control and contraceptive care for all the women that you kick off your insurance. You yeah. know, it's like it's like finding someone um, reparatively who breaks some public thing, who, who smashes some public thing. We should take it out of your hide in taxes and turn it around and give it to the women who need it. Mm -hmm. So, And that's mm -hmm. not going to happen, but. Just th this whole idea that you get to cite Jesus um, as an excuse for being cruel to your employees is so fucked up. Well, uh, and, so and the court, the court, and the women on the court in particular have have noted in their arguments what nonsense it is that a publicly traded company would have moral objections to women having contraceptive care. So men, <laughs> like, men yeah. can't get Viagra, right? I mean, oh, that's... yes, they can. Oh, really? Oh, yes, oh, they can. Oh, that's, yeah. That's very oh, shocking. Yeah. You know what? I'll inform Middlechild, the patriarchy ain't dead yet. <laughs> it ain't dead yet. No. 
Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court made a very interesting decision on Oklahoma as well. Yeah. And it's it's nuanced. Um, it had to do with a criminal case, a man who had been found guilty under state law of sex crimes and apparently uh, sentenced to 500 years in jail, um, argued that, uh, no, he committed these crimes, alleged crimes on native land. Uh-huh. And that argument went to, and therefore the state of Oklahoma couldn't prosecute him. That uh-huh. was the point. Sovereign nation, yeah. Yes. And uh, the Supreme Court said that's right. And that the eastern half of Oklahoma pretty much uh, is still under the treaty that Congress had in the 19th century. Oops, oopsie. And so now there's a whole lot of negotiation that has to go on with the tribes. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, going to be involve taxation. It's going to involve the city of Tulsa, uh, you know? water, the city of Tulsa. Exactly. Yeah. That these places are um, now subject to negotiations. And it does. It makes up about half the state of Oklahoma. That's quite a decision and and uh, good for them. Yeah. You want to talk about Simone Biles for a bit? Just just really quickly. She's on the cover of Vogue. Uh, and it's uh, fascinating to me. Um, how for someone so young, how good she is at communicating and how good she is at sort of managing her image and being positive. And, and she hasn't had an easy life. She's worked very, very hard to get to be the best in the world. Yeah. Uh, she's a short little lady. And mm-hmm. uh, pretty much that, in, that, yeah. adva- that advantage, that has been an advantage to her. And she talked about how People talked about my hair and they talked about my legs being too big and my hair being this way and so forth. And then she said, God gave me this body. And I guess this body is why I have so many gymnastic moves named after me, (laughs) you know. Uh, But um, one pull quote from this interview, uh, someone asked her, do you think we're obligated to stand up when something bad is going on in society? And the the article says the question summoned the specter of Larry Nasser, the longtime USA gymnastics doctor who is now serving a sentence of up to 175 years for the sexual abuse of athletes, including Simone Biles. He groomed her. Uh, for two years and counting, she has been trying. Simone Biles has been trying to hold officials in her sport accountable. Personally, for me, I don't think of it as an obligation. Biles said, I think of it as an honor to speak for the less fortunate and for the voiceless. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that said something to me. So that's how um, people in this country used to talk about paying their taxes. Yeah. First generation immigrants, especially it's an honor to pay my taxes. I I'm able to make a living in this country. I'm able to be free in this country. And it's an honor to pay taxes to keep this country, uh, proud and strong and prosperous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, it mm-hmm. wasn't theft. It wasn't slavery. It was the price of civilization. And until yeah. Republicans got their you know fingers into everything and wrecked everything. But it used to be that people, you know, felt honored to serve their country because they felt it was worth it. Well, now that everyone from the Ayn Rand Society to <laughs> Grover Norquist to the Catholic Church has taken a bailout from the federal government. Yeah. The Trump family. Uh, and, the of course, the Trump family. Mm-hmm. It's time for the anti-government nonsense to stop. Yeah, You'd think uh, so. You'd think so, and, yeah. And, except I, I still recall and could, if I stepped away from my computer and took four large steps, I could see on your corkboard your cover from Newsweek, yeah. I think. 2009. 2009. We're all socialists <laughs> now. We're all socialists now. Funny how, funny how the market, the, the magic of the marketplace, the invisible hand of the market turns into an outstretched give me, give me hand when when the shit hits the fan when the for big everybody. the banks are desperate. Yeah. Right. When the economy right. crashes, suddenly everybody's real interested in all working together to solve this problem we all have together. Right up until they get their head above water and then it's like, you know what? I bootstrap my ass out of this pool all by myself, and you should too. And yeah. fail, well, fail, fail. And, and there's no bigger example today of hypocrisy than Vice President Mike Pence. Really? Who said schools need to reopen because nutrition. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you can't feed people. school lunches, you right? Can't, you can't, first of all, yeah, the government handouts is what you're talking about. <laughs> government handouts for poor children. How many school about. lunch programs have been cut under Republican oh. rule? Oh. Yeah. Uh, right and left. My my 
X was deep into that. And it was, it was just appalling to watch them target the poorest and, and most um, uh, powerless Mm -hmm. among us with every kind of deprivation you can imagine. Poor children being the the easiest target. Therefore, the ones Republicans like to kick the hardest. Uh, But yeah, if you would like to feed children, there's a way to do it. It's by feeding children. And there's lots of ways to do it. But this whole arcane bullshit argument that you got to get them them crammed into school, shoulder to shoulder during the middle of a pandemic, seven hours a day, so you can give them, uh, I don't know, (laughs) spaghetti and, and chips is yeah. nuts is as a vegetable nuts. with ketchup yeah. yes no, right no and and i mean there are people in our community who are doing deliveries to people's homes for kids who are in school you help that you help them yeah. out yeah, yeah. and I, yeah. I pressed a couple of our our youngsters in this home into uh into service who are and they were extremely helpful i couldn't have done it without them but 120 families got fed that day thanks to this organization mm-hmm. and there's no reason in the world you just couldn't keep doing that if you yeah. really want to feed school kids, it's, it's, it's logistically very, very doable. Um, um, schools have kitchens where meals can be prepared. It's not impossible. It's not even that hard. It just requires someone who's not a filthy liar who's using hungry children to try to pry the government, uh, get the government to pry schools open so that his boss can get reelected. Asshole Republican yeah. can get reelected. Yeah. Uh, all right. So you have, you promised me. I did. An essay today. Yeah, I did. Uh, a thematic essay, including. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is, he promised folks. He promised me. He said, no, no, no. I know I'm going to talk about Andrew Sullivan, David Brooks, Charlie Sykes, and Brett Stevens. But I promise you, darling. <laughs> yes. It's thematic. It's thematic. And so here comes the drift glass rant on. Oh. Andrew Sullivan, David Brooks, Charlie Sykes, and Brett Stevens. Jesus, that's way too much of a... I will speaking. never live, live up to that setup. This was well, the week... This is, this is the lifeboat, right? Yeah. This nope. is the lifeboat crew. Yeah, this is the lifeboat crew who right. all have long and deeply held histories that they are in complete denial about. Um, <laughs> this was the week that Harper's um, ran an open letter from a whole bunch of people, some of whom I respect <laughs> a lot, and many of whom I just scratch my head and go, Really? Um, about the importance of freedom of speech and and people not being intimidated out of their opinions and how everyone, sh- you know, let a thousand opinion flowers bloom, uh, which if actually the world worked that way, that'd be great. But that is not the way the world works. There are lots and lots of people who have important positions, opinion making positions, agenda setting positions in the media because they were given those opinion, those those positions by the corporations that work for them. And those people are simply fucking terrible at it. They are wrong all the time. They've been wrong for decades. They have shitty opinions. And there is no countervailing force in the marketplace to push back at them. And those people are the ones who are threatened by this idea that this there's a rising generation. I'm not sure age is the correct metaphor. But there's a rising group of people who want those people to shut up or step out of the way or back off or have to answer for what they've done. And, and the ancien regime feels incredibly threatened by the fact that there's all these people who are now asking them to be held accountable for the shit they've said and done. And they don't want that. So they, so they retreat behind this ridiculous argument that, you know, every artist, every expression, every opinion, there shouldn't be any professional consequences. Well, look, you know what? Here's the thing. This used to be called, before it was cancel culture, it was just called at-will employment. <laughs> I, I've been fired from lots of jobs for the, yeah. where I was doing an excellent job for political reasons, for uh, uh, disagreements with management over moral issues, uh, for budget cuts, even though the people who they they kept were uh, minimally competent at best and massively incompetent at worst. So I, I used to have to have this conversation with younger employees. My ex and I would drive them home after work and, and uh, more than once. They were just shocked that that thus and so got fired for no reason. And we're like, yeah, well, you just can't fire someone for no reason. Like, yeah, you can. Millions of people in this country are fired every year for no goddamn good reason. Tens of thousands of reporters, real honest to God journalists have been sacked while, while parasites like David Brooks and Brett Stevens keep their job. That's not the, the a thousand opinions blooming. That is a corporate decision to keep people who protect the corporate bottom line and the corporate party line from any 
professional accountability. That's why these people can go on shows and talk to each other and lecture each other and never risk anyone like me in the audience asking them any inconvenient questions about the shit they said last week or last month or last year, which all turned out to be wrong. They want to be protected. They want a cartel. They want an embargo on people criticizing them because it's bad for their bottom line. They really do feel that they should not be criticized. Or if, or if they are, it should be the kind of genteel, well, we're all friends here. Like Mark Shields shaking his jowls, his good friend at David Brooks on, on Fridays and going, you know, my good friend David and I go way back and I just have this slight disagreement with him. No, we need people who are willing to run into the arena with a sword in each hand and take on these people directly. And that is exactly what the Beltway media does not want to happen because all these people, their arguments would fall apart in a half a minute. So, um, for example, today, Mr. David Brooks wrote an entire article about what ails our society when he talked about talking about liberalism. And liberalism is this and liberalism is that. And, you know, I'm a liberal. I believe in liberalism, classic liberalism. And he gets all of the liberalism part wrong. <laughs> all of it. Just completely wrong. And then he goes on to say what the cure to the ills of liberalism is, is personism. And then he goes on to explain what the fuck that is. And I'm going, you know what? You wrote an entire column about why this country is screwed up and you never mentioned the Republican Party once. Wow. And you never mentioned conservatism once. You know what? David Brooks just canceled Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Newt Gingrich and Laura Ingram and the entire history of, the, of his political party and his ideological movement because it's inconvenient for him to factor those things in. And if there were any justice in the universe, there would be someone sitting next to him in the virtual world challenging him every time he pulls this shit. But it's important to the Schulzberger family and the New York Times that David Brooks is never challenged, that no one ever asks him any inconvenient questions. Um, this week was the week that Brett Stevens decided that he would continue getting paid, of course, by the New York Times. Um so this is not the cancel. So I, I, my, my notes to myself are: this is not the cancel culture I was promised. <laughs> <laughs> Brett Stevens still has a goddamn job, and De Brett Stevens this week wrote it, uh, an article which basically says: sure, Trump is bad, but and here's the quote: the more serious problem today comes from the left, from liberal elites who, when tested, lack the courage of their liberal convictions, from so-called progressives whose core convictions were never liberal to begin with. From administrative types at nonprofits and corporations who, with only vague convictions of their own, don't want to be on the wrong side of a PR headache. That is bullshit. Top to mm -hmm. bottom, side to side. And 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 the way that Brett Stevens copes with this. Remember, Brett Stevens is Brett Bug Stevens. This is a guy, I, I know I mentioned this last week, who went out of his way to research a George Washington University professor when he said something mean about him on the internet and tried to get him fired. That is cancel culture. Mm -hmm. When the blowback happened, Brett Stevens responded by using every tool in his arsenal, including going on television and using his New York Times article to justify his shitty behavior. And then, then went off Twitter because he didn't want to deal with all the critics because he's a thin skinned, smarmy fascist. And everyone knows he is. And he doesn't want to be called that to his face because it's very offensive to him to have his bullshit called out in public. But honestly, my favorite example this week uh, comes from Andrew Sullivan. But it doesn't come from Andrew Sullivan today. It comes from Andrew Sullivan in 2013. <laughs> Andrew Sullivan loved cancel culture. Um, back when he was extremely upset with Alec Baldwin, because Alec Baldwin had said a homophobic slur over his shoulder at the paparazzi who was stalking his infant child. And Andrew Sullivan made it his personal mission to get Alec Baldwin fired. From wait, NFL. wait a minute. Wait a minute. When you say homophobic, do you mean sea sucker? Is that yes, what you mean? That is, and that's it. That's, that's it. Not... <laughs> I like, well, first of all, this is when Andrew Sullivan had moved to New York for about a minute and didn't know how New York was. Yeah. He moved, he moved from his that's little... not, that has nothing to do with being gay. Well, apparently it does. <laughs> Because he wrote column after column about the glaring double standard here. Oh, God. The double standard. I can't stand that anymore. What a bunch of hypocrites and phonies on that propaganda network, MSNBC. They're mm -hmm. almost as bad as GLAD, which has finally criticized the bigot 
but they went on, he went on and on how there'll be no consequences because the everyone there, Rachel Maddow, Thomas Roberts, remember him? He isn't around anymore. Jonathan Capehart, say nothing about it because they're all hypocrites. And then they fired Alec Baldwin and, and uh, Andrew Sullivan reveled in it. You know, he finally, finally, the MSNBC did the right thing and it would never have been tolerated if directed against any other minority group. And then very shortly thereafter, I'm sorry, calling a paparazzi who's bumping into your baby mm -hmm. to get a picture, a cocksucker. Right. And Andrew Sullivan makes it about being gay in New York City. Andrew Sullivan hates Alec Baldwin. Yeah. And Andrew Sullivan is looking for a reason to get mad about Andrew Sullivan. This is, this is what I used yeah. to call um, pineapple uh, ice cream conservatism. Mm -hmm. And I change it mm -hmm. to performative conservatism. This is whatever, <laughs> whatever, performative, everything, yeah. whatever, whatever whim or, or, or slight or anger is wafting through Andrew Sullivan's large, empty brain today. That is conservatism. Whatever he likes today is conservative. Whatever he doesn't mm -hmm. like today is liberal. And mm -hmm. it changes because his mood changes, but he continues to believe that whatever I happen to like today, whatever I have a taste for today, that's what conservatism means. And of course, Andrew Sullivan stays the hell away from anybody who's ever going to challenge him on his bullshit. But here's the thing. Andrew Sullivan has a friend named Niall Ferguson who went much, much further in his gay bashing and trying to get yes. people fired and on and on and right. on. And Andrew Sullivan rushed to his friend's defense. Sure, it was because bad. cancel culture is so bad. He, yes. He, he's right that calls for him to be fired are egregious and over the top. Andrew Sullivan says, agreeing with his friend Niall Ferguson. See, here's the thing. It, it's like in, in uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I hate to quote Mr. Potter, but, you know, if you're a friend of some guy in this place, you can get away with murder. If you're Andrew Sullivan's friend, you never commit any sins. If, you, if Andrew Sullivan doesn't like you, you're outside the pale and should be fired. And then when it comes to a conversation about cancel culture, you get this blank hound dog brain dead look on his face like, what are you talking about? This is, you know, I, I'm talking about abstract intellectual concepts, not, not my own behavior. I'm talking about other people's behavior. Other people need to be judged harshly. Other people need to be held to account for this. Not me, because I'm on the inside. And mm -hmm. that's the problem. The, it, it's these clowns. It's these white, male, privileged assholes who think their privilege is given by God, who are feeling a rising generation of critics nipping at their heels. And they don't fucking like it. They don't like the fact that people can mobilize against them. They can criticize them. They thought the wall that separated them from professional accountability was absolute. They existed in a, in a walled garden where nothing could ever get in and no one could ever hurt them. They could just shit out whatever stupid ideas they wanted. And as long as the Schulzberger family thought it was okay, or Comcast thought it was okay, or New York Magazine thought it was okay, they'll just keep getting paid for this. And these are all people who've gotten... Job after job after job after job. Bill Crystal being the worst example. A complete fucking bloodthirsty hack who has never missed a meal in his life. Who should have been fired from this planet 20 years ago. <laughs> and yet, for some reason, you can never talk about Bill Crystal. You can never fire Bill Crystal. You can never criticize Bill Crystal. He's above it all. And my contention is, if you really want to have a marketplace of ideas, if you really want to be in the arena, then get in the goddamn arena. And there's this protected, walled-off, milk-fed group of critics, pundits, who don't want that at all. They want to continue their, their little cartel of special Well, and people. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that this next generation coming up doesn't have – A, doesn't have time for their bullshit, <laughs> and B, they don't want – they don't have any in to uh, – describing or pontificating about black lives matter. No. And so their 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 particular opinion about George Floyd is America has a problem. Right. You know, this is this is a a humility issue. America is <laughs> very angry whatever. for lots of reasons, none of which right. I'll go into at the moment. Right, right. And so and and my job speaking as David Brooks for a moment, is to be a general expert on everything mm -hmm. and rewrite the history of the Republican Party every, what, three years? Mm -hmm. uh, and and they are being, I think, I think there's a threat to their uh, place in the 
firmament. journalistic ecosphere. Is yeah. that the right yeah. word? Well, the firmament, or uh, or in in Valhalla, or yeah. you know, in in, yeah. in the greater, and because they are at the very pinnacle, they are very privileged people. They're incredibly, and part of their deal is clearly, mm -hmm. I don't get criticized by anybody. Mm -hmm. Nobody's allowed mm -hmm. to talk shit about me. Nobody inside my group is allowed to talk shit about us. We are all in this together. We're a club. We're very chummy with each other. This is why the um, Lincoln lads, the, the Lincoln Project boys, took off so fast mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're all mm -hmm. friends with everybody in the media. So once Donald Trump took off, as, became the candidate and became the president, uh, it would have been very easy for people at the networks and on op-ed pages to find liberals who've been right about the Republican Party all along to give those people seats at the table, seats on panels, op-ed pages. That never happened. What they did was they found Charlie Sykes and Rick Wilson and gave them those seats. Because those people, they knew them already. These are our friends. These are our pals. These are people we spent time in motel rooms with on the campaign trail. And they're, they're not going to have the poor taste to mention that history started uh, didn't start in 2016. They won't bring mm -hmm. up old shit. We can all agree that everyone here got stuff wrong and no one knows what really happened. And let's just move on. And and there was that moment, shit, in probably 2015. Uh, I think I wrote a post about it, about uh, cannibals arguing about table manners. Mm -hmm. where, yeah. where just for a minute, Bill Crystal and, and uh, Joe Scarborough and his sidekick Mika uh, got into a punching match practically on the set of the Joe Scarborough show because it was who's to blame for Trump. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and Bill Crystal for a minute, for a half a minute, said, well, you have him on the show and you didn't do shit about it. And, and boy, did, boy, did and there, Joe Scarborough shout him right they, off. We, nobody's off more critical of him than we are. And and then Mika was yelling at, at Crystal like, he looks like you're going to cry. And it yeah. was that moment where you realize, oh, this is a club. This is a yep. this is a, a clip. And there are rules on and, Joe Scarborough's show about talking about his shit. And, yep. and, and those yep. rules apply everywhere. You're not allowed to criticize a fellow club member. And that's what is so terrifying about the Internet and blogging and podcasting, et cetera, is that there's a whole bunch of people out here who've been cut out, who truly have been canceled. You want to mm -hmm. you want to participate in cancel culture? Be a woman on Twitter. Be, a black, be a black woman on Twitter. black woman on Twitter. Nobody's right. going to ever hear from you again. You, go be Melissa Harris Perry for a day. Right. Or, and and right. a much less, you know, sort of. Shirley Sherrod. Yeah. Or a much less sort of um, spectacular fall. Be a liberal who wrote about the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and who wrote mm -hmm. about all the people who, who supported the war, supported Bush, who talked shit about liberals and who were proven completely wrong. And then were given jobs for life in the media and would mm -hmm. really like to know why. Why were those people, why was the David Frums and the David Brooks and the Bill Critchells given those jobs? And the answer is, dude, it's a fucking business and you're not, and, and you are a danger to us because you come into our midst and start pointing fingers and saying, what about what he said yesterday? What about he, what he said the day before? And that is not fucking allowed. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we, we roll merrily on. And these are now the people who've gathered together who are whining that somewhere someone might hold them professionally accountable for some of the shit they said. And there's this one back and forth. I'll, I'll leave it at this uh, from the uh, Bulwark podcast, which I listen to, as you know, as one listens to enemy broadcast to figure out <laughs> true movements and where they plan to deploy and shit like that. And Yasha Munk, who is a uh, American German Jewish political scientist, who's very popular on the right now on, on the mm -hmm. serious conservative right. Uh, and he, he, this is like a 45 minute podcast. He spent a good chunk of that talking about this terribly sad story about this, I believe, Hispanic gentleman who worked for a power company who was driving down the street and he, he was, had his window open. He was just enjoying life in America. And he was just driving through, through the streets of his town in a truck with the window open. And he had his hand out the window and he was like snapping his fingers or cracking his knuckles or something. And somebody saw him and thought he was throwing white power signs. And so they called the power company and raised a big stink, and this guy was fired. Mm. And that, my friends, is it's cancer culture. culture. Yeah. And, yeah. And you could just hear Charlie Sykes going, we are all that man. No, <laughs> no, you're not. You're absolutely yeah. fucking not that guy. That guy should get his job back because that was a dumb mistake. You, Charlie Sykes, have been a right-wing whore on Wisconsin radio for 30 fucking years. You shouldn't have a microphone anywhere. Nobody should be listening to you. The reason they listen to you is because you have friends in the quote-unquote liberal media 
who will give you pride of place, who will give you a seat at the table, who will let you, uh, who will promote your book, who will give you an op-ed column. And they will never, ever do that for liberals because liberals would have the bad taste to turn around and say, but you were doing this too. You the- well, and and I I want to give a hat tip to my Crooks and Liars colleague Capper, yeah, who pointed out, and Charlie Sykes is responsible for Scott Walker, you yeah. know, and all the well, anti-union crap that went on uh, in Wisconsin over the years. Yeah, oh, Charlie Pierce and I were comparing when when were you canceled by Charlie Sykes? When were you? <laughs> and that Capper was big news to me that Charlie Pierce was blocked by. Charlie Sykes. Well, that was you know, that's something. It's yeah. like Outlander, honey. And then there can be only one Charlie. So, <laughs> and, but but and then and then Capper came in and said, "Oh, you guys are pikers." He, he, he canceled me in the '90s, back when he was yeah. pimping for Walker and and the entire right. Right. Of the state of Wisconsin. But the the thing is, he people like Capper, that. By the way, is a union guy from oh. Wisconsin, so that 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 it has a there's a there's a history there. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. And uh, and as as stalwart, he's a stalwart ally. Yes. Um, But the point being, every one of these assholes has a long, bloody, awful record that in any other profession would completely disqualify them from having the job they have now. Mm -hmm. And the job they have now is a very rare and profitable job. It's a prosperous job. It's an influential job. So why are these people who are distinctly unqualified for this job continually given jobs like this? The people who've been right all along aren't and the answer is the people who run the companies don't want the people who are right all along influencing opinions they want the assholes and you can you can infer whatever you want from that but this idea that that now suddenly there's this cancel culture that's going to come from them (laughs) make them unhappy by calling them out by i don't know rereading shit they said a month ago and saying remember when you were saying this bullshit about a A or b or c remember rick wilson when you were all for mitch mcconnell stealing the supreme court seat Remember that? Because I do. It's on Twitter. What do you think about that, Rick Wilson? I think you're blocked, Drift Glass. I think you're blocked. So they don't want to compete. They want to win. And there's a big difference between the two. I wonder if part of it is watching uh, people who are genuinely racist Uh on Twitter and get caught on video getting fired. Mm -hmm. And it's as if you can't you're you as a racist white Republican can't say anything you want. And that threatens them. Mm-hmm. I think I don't know. a lot to that. And and so we can't say that. Mm-hmm. We can't mm-hmm. say. Right. We can't I say. Already... We can't say. I see a little bit of myself in crazy doctor lady claiming she can't wear a mask in the right. grocery store. Right. right? We can't make a, a, a profound um, intellectual and moral and philosophical statement about some asshole racist getting fired for being an asshole racist on camera. Right, right. So and gonna, threatening gonna, a woman in right. Costco. Right, so right. We're, we're going to inflate that into a giant, gassy, cultural thing that's happening to the very best of us. And that's why <laughs> people are self-censoring and, and they're, not yeah, being, yeah. they're not being honest and honorable with their ideas because there's this big thing that's... You know, that big thing used to be the big sweaty hand of white male privilege pressing mm-hmm, down on mm-hmm. everybody else. I, I think it's Zerlina Maxwell, who, whose book came out this week or last. This week, right? Who, no, who yep, says, the end of white politics, which yeah. is directed specifically at liberals. Yeah. And good for her. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, says, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm sure I'm quoting her exactly, but it's it's um, we've always had identity politics. They were, they yeah. were just called they were white male identity politics. And everybody thought, thought that was normal. We saw this the minute Barack Obama was elected. That's when. The yep. right, which was always fucked in the head, lost. It went complete screaming Flipped out. Because, Flipped out. Yep. Because the, the proper default setting where I can turn my brain off and not worry about anything is white, conservative, male, Christian. Right. And Barack Obama was not that. And therefore, something must have gone terribly wrong with the country. And the idea that, no, the problem is you're a racist is yeah. not something we're going to talk about. <laughs> it's not the answer they want to no. hear. Right. <laughs> You want to quote a couple of last minute quotes from Charlie Pierce? Oh, sure. Mark Mark McKinnon is on Morning Joe talking about he and W won in 2000 on a platform of, quote, restoring honor and dignity to the White House. (laughs) Yes. This is Mark McKinnon's history book. Yeah. Of his career, right? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. So Charlie Pierce says, yes, Cleo, the muse of history and I are vomiting in impeccable harmony. Yes, yeah. I'm sure they are. And then uh, 
you want do we really want to give any attention to Kanye West this week? Well, it's uh, yeah, we'll we'll give him that that uh that professional love bump. That'll that'll put him right <laughs> over the top. There you go. I'm not sure if you all know who Kanye West is. He's a performer of some kind of music. He's a singer of music yeah. somewhere. Yes. And, and his name is now Kanye Elizondo Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho West after of the idiocracy. president of yes. idiocracy. Because he announced that he's running for president on the they're going to use vaccines to put chips in our heads ticket. Which, yeah. you know, because we're not crazy enough already. Speaking of people who already have a chip in their head of some kind, yeah. uh, yeah. Kanye. The dude has problems. Uh, keep keep your, keep your the music going, Kanye. And and the uh, the odds makers, and by that I mean the people in my head, uh, yeah. are, are, are like, is this something that Trump slipped him 20 bucks and said, run for president and get the blacks off my back? The blacks. And yeah. Elon Musk said, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, Let's do that. Idea, yeah. Who's yeah. more expert on them than I am? Then Elon Musk. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I have to lay down uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of white guys who think they know way more than they do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do a quick news roundup. All right. At least 26 members of the Mississippi State Legislature have tested positive for coronavirus. Yep. Uh, we wish you well, we Mississippi do. State Legislature. Please get well soon. We would like you to recover from that and then stop being stupid. Stop being um, assholes. Yeah. Yeah. Donald Trump threatened universities tax exempt status this week. Quote, our children must be educated, not indoctrinated. This is from Twitter. Too many universities and school systems are about radical left indoctrination, not education. Therefore, I'm telling the Treasury Department to reexamine their tax exempt status. That is straight out of Dinesh D'Souza's filthy little playbook. Yes, it is. Uh huh. Trump threatened to cut federal funding if schools don't fully physically reopen. Trump, however, lacks the authority to force schools to reopen, and federal funding has already been appropriated by Congress. About 90 percent of school district budgets are raised by states and municipalities. And honestly, states and municipalities are really up against it this year. The tax receipts are horrible. They are. Uh, there are going to be cuts. It's going to be bad uh, without federal help. Uh, another reason to vote for Joe Biden. Yep. Um, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, who, by the way, every middle school child knows who Betsy DeVos <laughs> is. You know why? Yes, yes, they do. You know why they do? Radical left indoctrination. That's, that's right. why. Teachers make sure they know that name. <laughs> Teacher make sh teachers make sure that the middle school and above students know who the fucking education secretary is, yeah. who doesn't have a book in her office, a book. And uh, yeah. runs the education department like a yacht club. Well, and anyone who's surprised that the babies in cages party is yeah. okay with sacrificing the lives of your children. It is our freedom that allows school shootings to continue. Yes. yes. That is, I mean, that the party of school shootings, the party of babies in cages, of course, they don't give a shit about schools spreading or, the virus. Or children. They don't give a shit about you. Yeah. Let's, let's face yeah. it. Yep. On the other hand. No, Betsy DeVos claimed there is no excuse for schools not to reopen. Yeah, yeah other okay. Than massive amount of death and spreading of, yeah. uh, of yeah. our plague. Right. On the other hand, the CDC apparently ain't playing no more. They will not revise their guidelines for reopening schools despite pressure from President Stupid and the White House. And Dr. Anthony Fauci advised states having a serious problem with the surge in coronavirus cases to seriously look at shutting down. Yeah. Yeah. My sister uh, lives in uh, just outside Prescott. And Arizona. Uh, Arizona yeah. is the now global um, epicenter for virus spread. And she's well, just, we have relatives in in North Florida, too. Yeah. And she, another hot spot. Yeah. She's disgusted and, and just saddened by what ha is happening in her state. Mm -hmm. and And you could see it. I mean. She said, you know, you go out to, to the uh, to the town and you just see all these people up from the desert because it's, it's 120 degrees there. This is where they go. They're packed shoulder to shoulder. No one's wearing masks. Everyone's giving people who are wearing masks dirty looks like this is going to be very bad. And now it's very bad. Uh, one of the, of course, spinoffs of the COVID-19 and one of the spinoffs of the absolute criminal incompetence uh, of uh, what, what um, uh, Paul Krugman calls the doom spiral. Mm -hmm. of, of the the administration cannot admit it made a mistake. So they keep doubling yep. down on lying, which just makes things worse, which makes them double down more. And they're just going to keep doing that until someone drags them out of fucking office. One of the side effects is another 1.3 million workers filed new claims, new claims for state unemployment benefits last week. That's the 14th straight week of declines. 
more than 48 million people have now filed for unemployment benefits for the first time in the past 16 weeks. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vidman will retire from the U.S. Army after more than 21 years of military service over a campaign of bullying, intimidation, and retaliation by Donald Trump. Uh, File this under criminal can't stop criming. Michael Cohen has been taken into custody for violating the terms of his early release from prison. What a dummy. Trump has strongly implied that he's ready to pardon Roger Stone. He needs Roger Stone to tell him what to tweet in all caps through November. That's the deal. That's the only thing that's going to save him is Roger Stone. Um, And because we haven't screwed up everything about our relationship with the rest of the world completely yet, Donald Trump has officially notified the United Nations that we will withdraw from the World Health Organization in the middle of a global pandemic. That takes a year. Next year, let's have a new president who won't Mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. Mexico border towns try to stop Americans crossing amid the COVID-19 fears. Mm -hmm. Townspeople have blocked a road to the beach resort popular with U.S. tourists as cases surge in states, including Arizona. They're building a wall, Blue Gal. And They're going to build a wall, and Mexico's going to pay for it. Yes. <laughs> the president has made this country a shithole country. Currently, a tropical storm Fay is not expected to make landfall anywhere near Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Why is this interesting? Because Donald Trump says he is canceling his hate rally in Portsmouth due to the storm. And this looks like a job for Sharpie Man. Uh, there is a fun link that everybody should check out. Check out ca- the Canterbury Cathedral YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, the. Um, <laughs> Photo bombing, video bombing with cats. It's pretty the, good. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. hilarious. The, uh, there's one that came up this week with uh, Tiger, the cat Tiger, uh, just topping up on the table and sticking his paw in the Archbishop's tea milk. Because mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> they own the place. The four right. cats at Canterbury Cathedral, they run it. And they get to do what they want. Yeah. But we did want to recommend that you go and check out. If you Google uh, cats Canterbury Cathedral, you'll find the ones where the cats have just decided to take over the uh, virtual YouTube service. <laughs> Holy water, schmoly water. Oh, wait, I'm no. here. <laughs> no. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Hi. church. <laughs> um, and in local news, uh, we got we do have a little bit of local news. Uh, COVID cases are spiking here locally. There's nothing like Arizona, but it is somewhat alarming nonetheless. Our Senator, Tammy Duckworth, who rocks, by the way, Mm -hmm. Tucker Carlson had words to say about her. And uh, as I said on Twitter, (laughs) Tucker Carlson can keep Tammy Duckworth's name out of his shit spewing whore mouth. Mm -hmm. And Tammy Duckworth just said, why don't you walk a mile in my legs? (laughs) Which she doesn't have because... She's she's a veteran who lost her legs mm-hmm. uh, in serving our country in the military, mm-hmm. Tucker. Which is one of the long, long, long checklist of things that Tucker Carlson has never done for this no, country. He is a waste Tucker of Carlson. Yeah. Um, okay. Speaker Mike Madigan, who is a uh, corrupt man, he's a Democrat, he's an Illinois guy, but he did- House the, Speaker. He's the House Speaker House of Illinois. Speaker he has been since for as the, long as I've been alive 18, on this earth. The 1890s, yeah. he's been a, a yeah. House Speaker. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> and he's, he's in a bit of trouble with the IRS and a bunch of other things, but he's not uh, going he's anywhere. He's not exactly always on the up and up. No, he's right? not. Yeah. And we live in Illinois. We understand these things but we he do has announced, know that this is the case yes he has announced the statue of stephen douglas will be removed from the illinois capitol grounds why his portrait will also be moved from the house chamber madigan says douglas's disturbing past as a mississippi slave owner and his abhorrent words towards people of color yeah. and he is replacing the por- the portrait of stephen douglas with a portrait of barack obama yeah yeah. Which is not controversial in the Illinois State House. No, not not one all. little bit. Not where Barack Obama served. <laughs> There's also a, a Douglas Street in Springfield. I assume they're going to be changing that at some point. Hmm. I would hope yeah. so. That's That'll be my cause, Blue Gale. I'm going to get very upset. I'm going to take that street sign down. I'm going to yeah. be famous. I'm going to cancel that. Put up Black Lives that. Matter Boulevard. I think that'd be good. Nah, I, I really have, do. I, I don't have enough paint for that, but I'll, I'll do <laughs> something cool. Uh, we got a robocall from our representative, Rodney Davis, and you listened to the I voicemail. Did. I didn't listen I did, to it. Did he, did he tell us how to protest properly like he, he did on Twitter? No, he, he mentioned, his representative mentioned that uh, he is in favor of tax cuts, but he's against Nancy Pelosi and the radical left agenda. So, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no... There's no expense being spared coming come up with new messaging for the Illinois Republican Party. And wow. you just, in the background, you could just hear a record playing 
Suicide is pain. <laughs> you know, there's just, oh God, you're all so fucked. I mean, he might keep his job. That's that's sort of where we live. That's but it's his party is so here. deeply yeah. screwed. And and rightly so. The Republican Party needs to be burned to the ground and we need to piss on its ashes. And that's the end. That, I'm, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. However, well, and this is this is something to think about too, which mm-hmm. is we have to be safe mm-hmm. and and logical and use science in terms of reopening schools. Yes. In a normal year where schools and colleges and universities were reopened, we'd have a huge get out the vote campaign Absolutely. at U of I uh-huh. Champaign Urbana, which is in our district. Mm-hmm. And that could make the difference for Betsy Dirksen Londrigan to be elected to Congress. Yep. If if U of I Champaign Urbana does not reopen, which is likely, uh, it's going to be a harder climb for her. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just the fact, and that's unfortunate. But I'm not. I'm. I'm not willing to tell people's college kids, given that I have one right. at home. No, because <laughs> we want a Democratic Congresswoman right. to have an easier ride of it. Uh, we want your kid to risk getting sick. That's not. Right. I'll risk getting sick to vote against Rodney right. Davis. Exactly. I'm going to do that. Right. But I'm not asking anyone else's kid to do that. No. And that's the difference between the Democratic Party and Donald Trump's party. Well, and there's there's Rodney Davis news, which is separate and apart from him being a jerk, which <sighs> is he voted twice <laughs> against creating transparency for the PPP program after his family's business received PPP loans. Yeah. Um, there's See, a- I... Here's the deal with PPP. I don't have a problem no. with a church or any organization <clears throat> in this crisis who is trying to keep their janitor employed. Absolutely. Who's trying right. to keep their lay secretary getting a paycheck. I couldn't agree more. Yep. You know, but yes, there should be transparency and you should you should definitely have to account for every dollar that you get to forgive that loan. That yes, one hundred percent of it went to salaries for, you know, non board members, non millionaire board members, uh, people who are who type and clean and uh, do day to day work, who need money to pay their rent and mortgage. Pick, I'm not picky about that. No, uh, but man, the number of billionaires and millionaires who scraped that money up and because they had connections at the banks. And got the money. And this is, as Betsy Dirksen Lonergan said, these are our tax dollars. This is not Congressman Davis's money. It's not the federal government's money. It's our taxpayer money. Gosh, she sounds like a conservative. She sounds like a <laughs> conservative. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, she'll be we, in favor of unions and manufacturing. To know how our taxpayer mm-hmm. money is being spent. Mm-hmm. Yes. And from the Chicago said Times, a split decision in the COVID-19 rulings. This is something we didn't have a lot of time for last week, but we're going to take the time this week. In a downstate lawsuit, State Representative Darren Bailey, Republican of Xenia, Illinois, and his attorneys fought hard to keep in state court uh, that suing the governor to reopen the state. Mm-hmm. A Clay found- County judge yep. ruled in favor of the Republican legislature, according to the governor's office, and the ruling will be appealed. Uh, according to the order, the judge ruled that the 30 days of emergency powers under the Illinois Emergency Management Agency Act lapsed on April 8th, and any executive orders in effect after that date relating to COVID-19 are null and void. It granted... Uh, Representative Bailey's request that his complaint be a representative action and apply to all citizens of the state of Illinois. No. But, ac- <laughs> but according to the governor's office, that provision cannot apply statewide since other circuits have ruled the opposite. Yeah. And those rulings are just as valid. Yeah. The idea that a piddly Republican legislator would take the energy and time to sue the government, mm-hmm. the state government, the governor. This is a purely partisan bullshit thing to do. Mm-hmm. And he's a hero. And, and he's a hero all, on the all, right. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, we're set down here sometime in July, the 26th, I believe uh, the million maskless March. Oh God. Um, the same. These are the same assholes, the same clowns. It's all a conspiracy. It's all a fraud. It's all a lie. And they're unreachable. They're blocks. I of can't conference. wait to see the millions that show up for that. Well, There'll be 29 people. Yeah. 
and it's it's it and should all get sick. Well, it will it will correspond nicely um, with a massive national spike um, that we're clearly headed for. And I don't know how you cover this story other than each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. And I'm telling you, you guys, oh God, you need to go to our website proleftpod.com mm-hmm. and look at this baby kitty oh. whose eyes just open. Oh. Gosh. This week's internet kitty is Ron, and Ron is short for Rona because he's a little baby kitty who was born during the coronavirus pandemic. Mm-hmm. And his eyes just open, Mm-mm. and he's just as cute as can be. <laughs> Ron and his brother Oscar were found out by the side of a house and brought in as little newborn infant kittens. Oh. And they were fed every two hours around the clock. They responded well to care and started to eat and poop like champs. <laughs> They're little orange kittens. And as I said, this picture of Ron is the day his eyes open. And it's clear that uh, a young daughter of the house is holding the little kitten. And she's very <laughs> proud that she was able to save this little kitten. Well, the key. He, both of them are so cute. The key was and, clearly freshly poured cat food. Well, you know. <laughs> freshly poured formula yeah. and they they bottle fed these little baby kittens Aww. uh as they get older ron and oscar will of course eat freshly poured cat food our fake sponsor whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured freshly poured freshly poured oh my lord 